Right, so we're continuing our discussion of the kinds of behaviors that seem to make us happy. And I wanted to start with one that I think is a behavior that can completely improve our depression, it can improve our anxiety, but it's not often one we think of. And so imagine that we had a pill, that you could take this pill and you'd get all the following benefits. You would get happier, for sure, but you'd also get better grades, you'd also look better and improve how you look physically. There would be no side effects whatsoever. It would make you healthier, it would improve how your heart functions, how your immune system functions. It would be completely legal and it would be free, right? If we had such a pill, my guess would be many people would sign up to get it. And it turns out that we do have that pill. It's not called a pill, it's just called exercise. Exercise, moving our bodies just a little bit is one of the things that we know can improve our happiness. And we often don't realize that it can have the effect that it can have. This doesn't necessarily mean running a marathon or becoming a, like an ultra marathoner or like, you know, you know, crazy CrossFit exercise or anything. It really is just moving your body for 30 minutes a day. The evidence suggests it has huge benefits that we often don't think about. One is that there's lots and lots of evidence that e exercise can improve our overall positive mood. And these are from studies that didn't just look at the effect of exercise. It compared exercise to one of the best things that we have on the market for improving our mood, namely anti-depression medications. And so this one study kind of compared people who were suffering from a major depression and either assigned them for 16 weeks to do a little bit more exercise. So three times a week, they had to move their body for 30 minutes or they get the kind of leading antidepressant medication at the time the study was published, which is Zoloft, right? And we're gonna look at how many people, the percentage of people in this group that either recovered from their depression, kind of recovered, which is gonna be the black bar, or kind of relapsed. Those are folks who didn't recover so much. And this is what happens in the exercise condition. You're seeing between 80 and 90% of people basically recover from their depression in 16 weeks just exercising. And the exercise condition is actually doing better than the leading antidepressant medication. And so this is the case for depression. This is also the case I could show you different data for anxiety. Basically for many of the mental health conditions we know plague teens in your age group, just getting a little bit more exercise can really help. But of course, exercise has a ton of other benefits too. We know it helps our body. We know it like makes us look better and so on. But there's also evidence that exercise can improve your brain function. Like it literally can help you do better in terms of your academics as well. Hillman and colleagues looked at this directly. They looked at the correlation that students had between their physical fitness. This is actually in elementary school age kids. So the correlation between physical fitness and your academic achievement. And so they looked at students' standardized test scores, and then they brought students in and looked at their average physical fitness score. So this is that kind of like presidential fitness test that all of you probably took as kids. So is there any correlation between your academics and your physical fitness level, basically how much you exercise or how good you would be at exercising? And here are the correlations they find. If you look at students' mathematical ability, big, very strong correlation. If you look at students' reading ability, big, very strong correlation. So there seems that exercise might have benefits even beyond just making you feel better. It might be actually improving cognition and improving the way you think and how you do in school as well. We should be writing everybody a prescription, not for antidepressant medications necessarily, but also maybe for exercise too, free and helpful for you. And so how can we get all these benefits from exercising? Luckily, we have our Psych Pro Tips, they're back, yay! Um, and Psych Pro Tip number one is just an easy one, just move your body. Again, not ultra marathon, just 20 to 30 minutes a day, the evidence suggests can help. This could be doing the sports you normally do at high school, this could be kind of engaging and doing some weightlifting or even just running with your friends, right? It doesn't have to be much, it just has to be a little bit and very consistently. But the second site pro tip is that if you, if you struggle with getting in a little bit more exercise, then add in the kinds of things that might make exercise a little bit more fun. You can add some music to your workout. You know, one, one great exercise move is just to like get your favorite, you know, phone playlist and just play it for 20 minutes and just dance around your room or like do that with your friends, right? Um, and if you need suggestions, I will share my own personal Spotify exercise playlist for you to enjoy, um, which I'll send you, get, you all the link to so you can enjoy. But exercise, simply moving our bodies, a healthy habit that can improve our well-being. But there's a second healthy habit that I think is even more important for students your age, which is that if you really want to do the kinds of things that science suggests will make you feel better, you have to improve your sleep. This is an image of sleeping. I feel like for your generation, this is something that people are not investing in a lot, but it's the kind of thing that we know matters a lot for people's overall mental health. This is the kind of thing that students don't engage in because they're often worried about their grades. Um, in fact, my Yale students are so focused on their grades and not their sleep that they have memes that look like this, where you ask, oh, how did you sleep last night? 
I got a full 40 minutes. Yay. That's bad. You're supposed to be getting seven to eight hours a night. And in your age group, even eight to nine hours a night is sort of even more recommended. But you don't do that. And that's why you kind of come into class looking like this sometimes. Now, you might be saying, OK, you know, I, I care about sleep, of course. But like, I have to study, right, because I'm focused on my grades. We already learned that grades weren't necessarily helpful for happiness or helpful for the things you expect. But let's say, OK. Is it really the case that not sleeping is going to help you get good grades or staying up studying is going to help you get good grades? Well, there's lots of data on this. In fact, Hartman and Pritchard looked at this in a sample of college students, a really big sample of college students, and they looked at college students' sleep and what was going on with their academic performance and their GPA. And it's not what you might think. For every night a college student reports not sleeping well, on average, their GPA will go down by 0.02 points. If you do this by every night a college student is not sleeping, this can add up to take a real hit on your GPA. In addition, the evidence suggests that if you're not sleeping well, for every student that reports you're not sleeping well, you see a 10% increase in the likelihood that you might need to drop a class, right? Which is often, you know, you're failing it or you're not doing so well. Like, this isn't great. And when you look at the negative impact that just having bad sleep can have on your academic performance, it's as bad as if you self-report that you're going through a really stressful semester or students who have drinking and drug use problems, right? So we know substance use can obviously affect your academic performance. Just not getting enough sleep is that bad. So you might say, OK, fine, not getting sleep bad. But I know what I do. I, it's not like I don't sleep during the week, but then I catch up on the weekends. Or I do like one night, you know, like Sunday night, I'll just like do a bunch of sleep and kind of catch up. That's going to be helpful, right? The evidence suggests, sadly, not so much. In fact, one study by Phillips and colleagues looked at this directly. They created what they called a sleep regularity index. This means are you getting kind of consistent sleep over time? And the way they define this is what's the probability that you're in the same state across 24 hours? So if you're up at 8 p.m. on Monday, you're also up at 8 p.m. on Sunday. That's how they kind of did the math on this. And they looked at whether or not that correlated with your college GPA. And this is the graph I'm going to show you now. I'm showing GPA and the correlation with this sleep index. So bigger numbers are more regular sleep. And what you find is that there's a big correlation between your college GPA and your sleep regularity. As you're getting more regular sleep, your GPA is just necessarily going up. So these correlations suggest it's not that you want to skip sleep to study. You actually have to prioritize sleep to get the academic benefits that you really might want from studying. So getting less sleep, hurting your grades, but getting less sleep is also hurting your happiness. Um, in fact, one of my favorite studies to show my college students is this one by Dinguez and colleagues. They brought college students into a sleep lab and tested their mood across different levels of sleep. So students either got normal sleep, which is seven day hours a night, that's on average. They do that for two days. And then they spend a week getting restricted sleep. Now, this isn't like pulling full all-nighters or getting two hours or anything. They're getting five hours a night, which actually, on average, is what a lot of college students get. But this is the restricted sleep condition. And the question is, what happens to your mood? So I'm going to show you the different conditions from normal, restricted, and then the researchers are nice. They let students go back to normal sleep at the end of the session. And I'm going to plot the, what's called a profile of mood score. So bigger scores are better mood. Like, like you're kind of happier and joyous. When you're at the bottom of the scale, it kind of looks like you're clinically depressed. And this is what happens after a single week of not getting enough sleep. Basically, by the end of that week of five hours a night, you look like you're clinically depressed. I actually think we could solve most of the mental health problem in college-age students and high school students if we just forced you all to get a little bit more sleep. And so sleep, really good. And that means we have to pay attention to the things that might be affecting our sleep. We need to really pay attention to what you might call our sleep hygiene. What are you doing right before you go to sleep? Or what do you have near you when you're trying to sleep? And the problem is that a lot of teens your age have one of these next to them. You sleep with your phones, which makes sense. It's your alarm clock. It's your like thing that you're attached to at your hips. So you don't want to give it up. But of course, this thing is emitting a lot of blue light that might be affecting our wakefulness. It's got, on the other side of it, a lot of anxiety-provoking information that's going to affect your attention. Right? Is this thing affecting your sleep? And the answer is really yes, and especially in your age group. In fact, Wood and Scott did a study where they looked at students' social media use and the quality of sleep that they're getting. And what they find is that the students who report the worst sleep quality were the ones who use social media at night, the ones who are using social media right before they went to bed. And in fact, what they find is the more social social media use you have, not only the poorer sleep you get, but also the higher scores you have for anxiety, the lower self-esteem you have. Like it has a whole host of mental health problems, just like having your phone near you before you go to sleep. Not very good. And so how can we fight all the bad effects of sleep deprivation, having our phone near us? How can we promote better sleep hygiene? Of course, we have our psych pro tips. They are back. And the answer is, again, a very simple one, which is like, just sleep. Like, seriously, just like sleep more. It, 
I know there's stuff to do. I know there's so much attractive stuff, but if you can just get the right amount of shut eye, you really will improve your mental health much more than you expect. And along with that, I think consider the possibility of finding ways to sleep that's pretty far away from your phone. Um, again, it's not great to fall asleep kind of like this, and that is what many of us do. And the excuse is often for, for teens your age is like, well, I need it for my alarm clock, right? Just invest in like a cheapo, like, you know, old school 80s alarm clock. They have them, like you can get them for cheap. It really will keep your phone far away, so you're not tempted to pick it up in the middle of the night when you wake up. It's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And so that's kind of the behaviors that we need to make us happy in terms of our healthy habits. We need to promote more exercise, moving our bodies, but we also need to engage in sleep.